here. So kind of an unusual time for me to do a live stream. I actually had this week off. I didn't realize that I went to work yesterday and everybody kind of forgot. I thought I had taken the 15th off through the 20th and I had actually taken the 12th off through the 20th. So anyway, I went to work yesterday and worked all day when I didn't have to. And then I went again in this morning and worked for a little while before I realized I'm on vacation. So what do you do when you're on vacation? I guess you go back and you do some more work. So that's what I'm up to this morning is I decided that I would come out and do a live stream talking about how the inflation is running extra hot, extra long for an extended period of time. And wow, I wonder who have been saying that for, you know, pretty much ever, right? So um, here we are, right? Inflation data is coming in hotter than expected. You know the Federal Reserve is going to be keeping their interest rates elevated for a significant amount of time. And this is not a surprise to anybody like who's been following this channel or anybody who has really just been listening to the Federal Reserve themselves as they have been demanding the higher inflation to actually cure their problems that they were facing back in late 2018 or well, even earlier than that but stated in a speech given by john williams late in 2018 talking about how inflation expectation was just persistently too low so here we go right the federal reserve is now in a position in which they have their inflation expectation running hotter than what would be guessed normal you know whatever normal is supposed to be and it's going to create issues going into the markets and especially when it comes to the bond market or borrowing money in general and that's really what i wanted to talk about within this video i mean i had actually thought about this talking about this particular topic before the inflation data come out but i thought you know because everybody's going to be looking at inflation data we might as well include that within this live stream as well so really today's live stream is going to be talking not only about inflation and how the federal reserve is going to be handling this da data but then also, what is the Treasury up to right now? Because something seems to really be taking place that not a lot of people are focusing in on. And again, it just seems like I key in on a lot of this stuff that I guess other people just don't notice or maybe just don't find important or something like that. But to me, it's like probably the most important information that you could be taking in. And right now, part of that is the bond buyback program coming from the Treasury. Now, this is something that, again, like not a lot of people seem to be talking about. When I Google it, like just Google for news articles, just finding anybody's opinion on it, right? Just get anybody talking about it. There's not a lot. Not a lot of people are talking about the bond buyback. Now, what is a bond buyback? For those of you who are like, you know, what the hell does that even mean, right? The treasury itself, right? The treasury is the issuer of the debt. The debt is bonds. So whether it's a short term, you know, something like a one month bill or note or something on the shorter term all the way up to like 30 years which is like where the bond market is really kind of focused in on is like the 10 year and those later dates as far as the inflation expectation when you have a higher inflation expectation the long dated bonds have a tendency to rise now the problem what we face within this bond market is is that the u.s treasuries are by far the most liquid most desired most safest, most safe haven, whatever you want to call it. Like it is the asset of all assets, right? Because they're guaranteed to pay zero chance of default. And so this is the way the world looks at it. Now, whether or not you view it that way or I view it that way really isn't important as much as this is the way it is when you look at it through the, the, the eyes of the economy. The markets look at the U.S. Treasuries as by far the most liquid, deepest, awesomest market you can possibly be in. And if there was ever any kind of issues within this market, that would create some major ripples throughout the financial markets. Now, this, I left a few links down in the description. One of them is, to, is from the U.S. Treasury itself, right? And now, let me see if I got this right. The secretary, the assistant secretary to the financial markets, who whatever position that is at the treasury josh frost if i got his name right had this to say like well if you go and you look in that statement coming from the treasuries all the way down at the bottom they are still planning forth with their bond buyback program now everything that you kind of read on it it is is very nonchalant nothing to see here don't worry about it it's just this normal thing that's doing that we're doing over here so keep looking keep focusing on that stuff over there bond buyback not a big deal. 
not a big deal at all. Don't even stress it, right? We haven't done it for 20 years, but no big deal, right? This is kind of the way I feel when I see this because there's not a lot of people talking about it. And this is the way they kind of put this characterizing of this particular event coming up. Now, okay, I know I'm talking fast. I had a lot of coffee. I'm kind of excited this morning because I'm on vacation. Didn't even realize it. Now, here's here's the thing. Most of you who have been following me on my channel know that I talk about that damn gold machine and the credible threat theory. It's part of like my whole theory that the Federal Reserve is doing right now with the monetary policy is that they use jawboning or their words or for guidance or just the simple idea of a credible threat, meaning that the markets believe that they are going to be doing they're going to be doing something and begin to act as if they had done something. So like the Federal Reserve is going to be lowering rates and all of a sudden you see the mortgage market start to come down because people actually believe the Fed was going to be lowering rates. That's like a credible threat. That's kind of like a short shot credible threat, right? The bigger credible threats are ones like the quantitative easing programs, all this money printing causes inflation, right? And so like this is a much, much bigger credible threat. And if you think about quantitative easing one, two, three, and four failing to produce the Fed, the inflation scenario that the Fed was looking for, you can really see how quantitative easing was a credible threat theory very well played out. Same thing with the special purpose vehicles that were used during the pandemic. These were entities set up away from the Federal Reserve and the Treasury that could only be used in unusual and exigent circumstances and the credible threat that this special purpose vehicle was going to be buying heavily into corporate debt said that the markets were going to be like, damn, yeah, let's get that corporate debt before the Fed has a chance to buy it and we can front run the Federal Reserve. And this drove the value or the value, the price of corporate debt way up and the yields way down. And these corporations were able to get a lot of funding in this manner before that special purpose vehicle was even set up. Just the credible threat alone that it was going to be there and the market's perception and everybody screaming about it was enough to get that stimulus going to these corporations through just the sheer idea of the special purpose vehicle being set up. Now, now that we got all that information out, Y'all got that? Did you get everything so far? I mean, I know I'm talking really fast this morning, but I like a lot of you have probably already heard this information a million times. But it is important to understand this because right now we are going into liquidity issues. You can see it everywhere. This is the reason why you're seeing the markets like, you know, so upset by this whole idea, even though it wasn't like that big of a, to, well, to me, it wasn't that big of a deal the information that came out, but yet everybody is perceiving it as that way. The Fed's gonna hold on to the higher interest rates for longer. Everybody's pissed off about the about the news and the liquidity is going to be drying up because of this, right? People are gonna be hoarding on to their money for longer, believing that their bad times are gonna last longer than... See, this is what gets me. Before I, before I read this part right here, this is what gets me. Bad times ahead is like good news because the Fed would lower interest rates to try and stimulate into the bad times, right? Bad, like good times are bad because the Federal Reserve is going to keep the interest rates elevated because like, do you see how the market has this so bass, back, bass, I can't even say it now, has it backwards, right? Anyhow, now that we, I'm just, I don't know why I digress. Okay. Um, Let's go back to the credible threat theory. Think about this. This came out of a Bloomberg article a while ago. I don't even know how well, how far back this Bloomberg article is. I left a link down in the description for it. And Josh Frost, this assistant secretary to financial markets for, at the Treasury, had this to say. Buybacks can help improve the liquidity of the Treasury markets by providing a regular opportunity for market participants to sell back to Treasury to treasury off the run securities across the yield curve okay i should explain that real quick off the run securities are basically the bonds that have already been issued like on the run securities are the brand new ones so the brand new ones that come into existence are the on the run securities the moment that new bonds are issued those on the runs become off the run because they are now like further out 
as opposed to the brand new ones that are being issued. Did I say that right? Okay, so you got on the runs, the brand new ones, like off the printing press, so to speak, and then off the runs are the ones that have already come into existence. So let me read that again, right? Just so we can understand this because this is the credible threat right here, right? It's, I mean, he is, he is straight up telling us this is exactly what they are planning on doing, all right? It is using this credible threat theory. Or not even the theory, like this is the credible threat. It's my I don't never mind. Here we go. Buybacks can help improve the liquidity of the treasury market by improving the regular opportunity for market participants to sell back to the treasury off the run securities across the yield curve. Th here it comes. This should improve the willingness of investors and provide liquidity in the securities, in these securities, all else equal, knowing there is a potential outlet to sell some of their off the run holdings. Did you guys get it? Right. Just the idea that the that the Treasury is going to be there to buy back bonds is enough to get the, the investors to provide the liquidity that they need. Like, let me read it again. Right. It's just so because so I'm not making this stuff up. Right. This is what he says. This should improve the willingness of investors and provide liquidity in the securities, all else equal, knowing there is potential outlet to sell some of their off the run holdings, the outlet being the treasury itself. This is the credible threat theory. This is how you know that like when this, this and, they, and they say that this is not for liquidity issues, but this is what drives me crazy is like, when you start reading about this, this is not for liquidity stress. They, they, they emphasize that. This is not for liquidity stress. This is like a normal thing that is going to be taking place. We scheduled this a long time ago. It just happened to land right in the middle of a liquidity crisis. Huh? huh. Weird. Very, very coincidental. Like, you know, really? Like, I mean, they've been like talking about this for a while. It's one of the reasons why I believe there was even a liquidity crisis coming is because they said this was what they were going to do in the middle of 2024, at the beginning to the middle of 2024. Nobody knew exactly when it was going to happen because I don't think anybody knows exactly when the liquidity crisis is going to hit. Right. But they, but I love how they say this is not for liquidity stress purposes, but yet it's starting to occur right during the time that we are going to be exposed to liquidity, liquidity stress. I mean, come on. Right. Like, I am just some dude sitting here. Like, I am not that smart to say, like, dude, you can't pull the wool over my eyes that easily. Right? I mean, I know, like, it's easy to do if you don't follow this stuff. But you know what? I kept that article. I saved it. Right? I saved it along with a lot of other articles because I can't remember all these things. But yet, it's real easy for me to go back and read that article again and go back and find it again if I hold on to it. But most people don't do that. But I did. Right? So now I get to go back and say, listen to what you said, bro. Right. You said it was going to be a credible threat that you're using this idea alone to get the investors willingness to provide the liquidity in the security markets. It's a credible threat straight up. Follow it through. Right. Let's let's watch it happen. We can watch it happen. And 249 people and anybody who decides that they're going to watch this after the upload are going to be able to watch this happen in real time. And they're going to hear the stories and the politicians and all the other crap that goes out there. And you're going to know already what's going on. There isn't going to be some imaginative, like, you know, what, what, what they're doing. I mean, we know it. We know exactly what they're trying to do and why they're doing it. All right. Simon's lit up on coffee. Uh, let's go back here. I thank you, by the way, to the person I saw that just pop up there who had joined the channel. That is very cool of you. Um, what is this? Cyan? Saying a blaze, kind of blaze, sign of blaze. All uh, right. Sorry. I'm terrible with coming up with, uh, pronouncing names in general. Not that it's, what is that, cyan, cyan? Anyway, cyan. Thank you very much for joining the channel. That is a members-only channel in which that we break down some really good information that I have been studying, whether it's coming from the Federal Reserve or some other documents that I have, like, kind of researched. We break these things down in a members-only live stream that has really got some just very not only serious, but intelligent people who are, you know, contributing to the conversation, which really is just incredible. Like, um, how did all nighter put it? I think he, he said they're very productive if I, if I remember right. And they are too. They're incredibly, they're, they're incredibly good, uh, good live streams and the membership is only a dollar a month, right? So you get to support the uneducated economist. You, the viewer gets to sponsor the uneducated economist instead of taking some sponsorship from some company he doesn't even care about. 
but I get, to, I do care about the viewers. I do care about this knowledge. I do care that we get this information out and I do care that the serious people get access to the information and the questions that they need. And that's where those live streams are really beneficial. So just like these ones are, and you know, I'm about ready to start reading through some of these comments. I encourage everybody to join that live stream. Okay. Let's see here. Morning, everyone. Hey, come on, all nighter. Okay. Love you, my brother in Christ. Thanks for letting me know we are not in good financial health. Yeah, you know, and this is like the, that's like the important part of it is like to understand this information. Like this statement was made, I don't even know, a year ago, maybe, I don't know. I, I don't even know how old that article is, right? I just remember reading about it a while ago and thinking, wow, that's something to remember. And I would like, I would Google it every once in a while treasury bond buyback program and there was nobody talking about it and then occasionally like all of a sudden there would be an article pop up like one i had just found not too long ago a couple months ago saying like that was it saying this is not meant for like liquidity stressful stresses in the market this is like a very very casual thing that we're doing over here nothing to see don't worry about it and then i'm thinking uh, what don't, don't bring that up. No, don't say that like that, right, man? Because it's obvious, like, what's going on here, right? You know, and then all of a sudden here we got this liquidity issue starting to come up and this thing happens at the exact same time, just coincidentally, it doesn't work like that. You know that, right? You know? Uh, I have watched this channel for years. Love is mind. Hey, thank you very much, BAM Media. You know, and this is the thing about, like, I've really stuck. I mean, there's some things that I got wrong. You know, there's some things that I know that I that I missed. And, you know, you can't you, nobody's going to be able to be 100 percent accurate on everything that they call out. Right. The idea is that once you get new information in, then you should be able to be somewhat flexible in what it is that you have belief in in what it is that has taken place out there. Some things I have been so like etched in stone adamant about that like there is no deviation to it. you can go back like i have i've gone back and looked years and it sounds just like i'm talking today and it's because i have followed this particular strategy without deviation to it because there's no deviation to the strategy when they talk about it right if there was deviation to it then i would be able to like describe it but when it comes to the federal reserve's monetary policy strategy and the research that i have done starting back in late 2018 and just been like pretty much daily on it tells me a much different story than what it is that everybody else was believing out there. And those who have followed me on this channel, which, you know, I mean, I have a good 5,000 or so hardcore followers on this channel. They know it. They've seen it, right? They saw the they saw the theory kind of play out, even though a lot of times it is so difficult to actually wrap your hands around or the mind around just what that theory is when there are so many different components and parts and changes to it. And, you know, when you start adding into, you know, things like wars and natural disasters and stuff, it gets really complicated to, to try and wrap your head around. All right, I'm moving. Let's see here. I heard the car market is having so many delinquencies. The government will have to turn in at end, ye end of year to forgive all auto loans and leases. How will this affect the economy? I don't believe that will happen. Do you, I mean, do you honestly think that there's, I mean, okay, the government's going to have to come in. Okay. This is what it's going to look like. Okay. This is, this is how this would go down. This is to understand, like, you know, to, uh, to understand what this would like to conceptualize this, even though I think like wasting time on a, on a belief like this, not to, not to knock your question at all, man, because I think it's a very legitimate question. The thing is, is like, once I have. Like, I just take an initial thought of it. It was just like, man, this is such a far off concept that is not going to ever take place. And it's better to move on to like, you know, more progressive, better ideas of what it is that you need to do to, to prepare for your, for your future. But just to take this into thought, right? So you have all these auto loans out there, right? Auto loans are very much like any kind of other loan out there, like a mortgage backed security that they end up getting securitized, right? So, or it packaged up into a bigger security. So it's packaged up with a bunch of other auto loans. And then those auto loans get sold off to, you know, investors or whatever. So it's not like just an individual auto loan is owned by the bank. It might be, you know, but it may not be. It may be part of this other security that's out there. And so now you have to think about it. Who is it that's going to write that thing off? Right now, who owns that? Who owns that particular, you know, item? And is it the government that's going to come in there and buy that? Now, what is it they're going to use to buy that? They're going to use taxpayer money. Now, that doesn't work out too well, right? To, to, to buy a toxic asset like an auto loan, 
that's being delinquent, right? Now it's different when you have the Federal Reserve buying toxic assets like mortgages. Like it's even scary enough on that, but then when you think about an auto loan that, you know, it's just like this thing is not even like an asset, like a piece of property or real estate, it's literally a piece of machinery that deteriorates over time, right? No matter what you do to it, I mean, it takes consistent maintenance and effort to try and keep this thing with any value, unless you like just lock it in the garage and make it safe and sound and never touch it, right? So. Like a car is a terrible asset, like the worst asset in the entire world out there. And especially if you're asking me, because I drive really, really old cars, right? <laughs> like, you know, so anyway, waste, back to back to thinking on this. So the, the government's going to waste money, waste taxpayers money buying an asset that's going to be deteriorating because what they're ultimately going to have to do is buy that that security, right? That loan, put it on their balance sheet and then write it off. Right. So now what happens to their balance sheet is that they put this asset on there. Right. You got assets and liabilities. Right. So you got this asset. The liability is out there. That's the money, whatever. Right. But you take this asset on that's supposed to pay you back all the money. But now the asset becomes worthless. Your liability is out there. Your credit rating goes to shit. Right. So this is why it doesn't quite work. Right. You can't do it like this. This is the problem that they're facing with student loans. That's why they won't write them off. It's because all these student loan asset backed securities that are sitting on the government's balance sheet doesn't really give them the ability to just like, hey, just disappear because it would throw their balance sheet out of whack, messing up their credit ratings. And then they would not be able to borrow at the lower rates. Well, like they're borrowing at lower rates now, but it would it would create all kinds of other issues within their within their financial systems anyway, right? So this is the reason why they can't write off the student loan asset-backed securities and one of the reasons why they're just not going to go and write off a bunch of auto loans as well or any other loans. Like there's no debt jubilee thing. Like I don't see debt jubilee. That's like, to me, that is like, I don't, I don't even try to conceptualize a debt jubilee at, in any way. Like, you know, even though there is examples of stuff like that happening, like, you know, like, I remember we reported on credit card, like these people who had some credit card debt up in Canada is one day it was just gone and they didn't have to pay it back anymore. And I thought that was quite an interesting story. Hey, right on. We got 316 people watching right now with 71 likes. I would like to see that up to 200 likes in the next 10 minutes. So go hit that like button, everybody. All right. Um, buy Bitcoin and chill. Yeah, I buy some Bitcoin. I mean, I bought a little bit last, what, about three weeks ago or so. So, yeah, I buy Bitcoin in small pieces. You know. All right. Just my two Satoshis. Right. BTC is too posse? Posse? Been sending letters to HQ to bring it back down to 7K. Hope it works. All right. Would love some sub 10K BTC. Would be nice. Yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I like it when things like that I'm buying like that, like Bitcoin, silver, anything that's like the things I want to stack and have a lot of. I love it when they're cheap. I mean, I, I don't want to see them run up. I mean, it's exciting to watch it happen. It's like, wow, watch Bitcoin move, especially, you know, I have almost half a Bitcoin now. So when it moves, it's like exciting to watch that move, you know, especially, you know, being a guy like me who doesn't have a whole lot. It's that that kind of thing is just like, wow, that's pretty cool. But ultimately, I don't want it to do that. I want it to be very cheap and I want it to be very cheap for as long as possible, like until I'm 80 years old. Right. I want it to be very cheap. And then the day I turn 80 years old, I want it to just go through the roof. Right. And then that way I can like spend the rest of my life, you know, enjoying it and not having to you know worry about anything like maybe even better. Maybe like, you know, I, I think 80 because I, I think I have to work too much. 72 until i'm 72 years old there we go <laughs> uh hey dish is great to see you up in here is gold and silver good luck with waiting for bitcoin to go down to seven yeah uh people now realize fiat money is dead yeah i mean it is i guess you know I mean, it still works, right? I mean, I went down and bought some stuff earlier today. Plan on doing it again later. I mean, it's working for, for now. I mean, it's not a great thing. And uh, don't get me wrong. Like, I don't look at the dollar or the Fed or anything else as, like, some awesome institution that does great work or anything like that. Like, not by any means do I believe in that. But it's not for me to to decide, like, you know, what it is that needs to happen or the the way that we need to 
you know, conduct government or the banking system or anything. My job is to make sure that I'm doing it for myself, right? That I am doing the best actions that I can in accordance to what it is happening out there. And I feel like a lot of times we get information of the way it should be or the problems that are existing within it, but very rarely do we look at the, at the information in a way that how do we use this information to position ourselves in a better fashion and knowing what it is that they are attempting to do and why it's going down the way that is and the stories that we hear out there I mean, they can be whatever they want. It doesn't affect us as bad, especially like, you know, stuff like studying like this bond buyback. This has been very like odd for me. Like, I mean, I, I heard about it in like, how come it is that I just don't see a lot of people talking about it? It's just like another one of those things. It's just like so casually like swept under the rug. And I'm like, no, that's a big deal. Like, that's a really big deal. And everybody's just like, well, nobody seems to talk about it, so it can't be a big deal, right? Because if it was a big deal, everybody would be talking about it, you know? <laughs> All right, class in session, yes, absolutely. I mean, you guys, like, I thank you guys for being here and following this, but how it is that I have gotten here and being like, you know, somebody telling me, like, dude, this is a class, you're like a teacher, you're like an educator, I don't know how, <laughs> how did this happen, you know? And so... Uh, on vacation, didn't realize. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? And the Fed love the name. Um, yeah. I mean, literally, like, I work so much, so often, all the time, that, like, it was just, like, I just kept, it was Monday, go to work, right? And it was just like, you know, people were like, are you on vacation? And I'm like, yes, I am. Yes, I am on vacation. What are you going to do? Um, go fire up a live stream, go back to work. All right. That's it. <laughs> That's right. United States Department of Treasury is kicking the shit out of the Fed Bank. Huh. I'm, I'm not sure. This is why rates are coming down and inflation is going up. Yeah. I think... I honestly believe that there is going to be coming a moment in the future if this liquidity issue is going to be as prevalent as I think it's going to be to have an issue in which that the bond buybacks are going to provide an opportunity to improve the willingness of investors to provide the liquidity to the security market. I think that's going to be a situation right there before that that's going to start driving the prices of those bonds up and the yields down. Right? That's what... That's what I believe is, well, I'm sorry, the, that would be like the idea if the Federal Reserve was to lower rates, like going into the future, right? If that was to be the case, then everything would be ultimately hunky-dory, right? Like if the bond market was to continue to rally. Now, let's, let's, geez, it's so many ways to explain this. Okay, so let's. Think about this in a, in a fashion in which that the Federal Reserve is not going to be there at all, right? Like, like literally exclude them out of the belief of them participating within the next, say, six months to a year, other than the act of unwinding their balance sheet like they normally do, right? And that right there is, is very difficult to try and, and conceptualize within itself because the idea that they are the ones who are the liquidity providers is is so prevalent within the market so now also they are the interest rate setters so being there as an interest rate setter and the provider of liquidity makes it very difficult to then say okay i'm going to block them out for the next six months on what's going to take place here because that's really what ends up needing to take place because they're going to try and maintain exactly the same position in which that they are in which means that they're not going to impact the economy other than what they are doing right now right is that did i get that so far okay so the unwinding of the balance sheet and the maintaining of the interest rates the fed is going to try and like sit on their hands and, and stay still issues that begin to start to happen within the market itself like within the economy people are going to start getting paranoid within this this time right now there's two pet pa pa two ways that this could go, right? I mean, there's one, right, where everything is cool, right? Inflation is coming down, right? Or, you know, whatever. Uh, interest rates are gonna come down, right? 
this is like the soft landing kind of scenario, right? That's like what I guess the Federal Reserve or the Treasury and everybody is like hoping for is that this would be the situation that would take place is that everything is just like kind of starts smoothing out to what people would have expected from the times before. Now, that very well could take place. What I see them getting prepared for, on the other hand, is something much different, right? And that the moment that people have a very difficult time paying their debts, what do you do about it, right? Now, there could be the debt jubilee because, you know, people just simply won't be able to do it and they're going to have to get their car, you know, like they won't be able to make their car loan payment or whatever, right? So this is like the idea people are not going to be able to make all these payments. There's like a debt saturation, so to speak, like they can't take on any more debt and therefore they can't roll debt over into new debt and then pay, paying off old debts doesn't take place. They don't have enough income coming in from working. So paying these debts are not going to happen. What do you do? You got to pay the debt. You start selling off your toys, right? You start selling off assets and you start liquidating the things that are the most liquid things that are out there. And what happens to be one of the most liquid things out there? the U.S. treasuries, right? So now if we're sitting in a situation that people are very paranoid about needing the cash in order to like continue on with their way of life and not losing all the things that they have ever worked for, then they have to come up with that cash and they generally come up with it with the selling of assets, whether that's toys or the most liquid assets out there being U.S. treasuries. That's one of the reasons why I feel that the, U the United States treasury is setting up and believing in the idea of being involved in a bond buyback program right in the middle of that situation, right? It just like literally having set it up may prevent it from even taking place. And that's what's like, you know, mind blowing about the whole thing, like setting up the special purpose vehicle to buy corporate debt, like literally the thought of it alone, the credible threat of it coming in online was enough to provide the funding to these corporations. They didn't like, if they hadn't done the idea, if they didn't say, hey, we're gonna have to set up this vehicle in order to do this, in order to this special purpose vehicle, this entity that would only exist in unusual and exigent circumstances, if we did not set this thing up, right, ahead of time, if the Federal Reserve and the Treasury did not do that, the credible threat would never have existed and, that, and those corporations never would have gotten the funding. This is what's like, you know, this is so, crazy about it. Like people don't even think about how it is that these corporations are sitting on all this money right now. And they don't even think all the way back to that credible threat that came during the pandemic of setting up that special purpose vehicle. It's so amazing. Like that is not in anybody's theory. Well, I mean, it might be in some, but very rarely do I read about it or hear about it when I, when I'm out there doing research and stuff, it's like almost forgotten about. But I won't let, I won't, I won't forget. Like, I'm not going to let it be. I will keep beating that thing up, right? Keep dredging that stuff up. So it makes it clear. It makes it easier to understand how it is that these bond buyback program coming from the treasury is going to work in that exact same fashion because that's how they described it within their own statements coming from the assistant secretary of the treasury. You know? Let's go check out that super chat. Thank you, everybody, for being here today, too. We got 306 people in the live stream. We've been at it for 33 minutes. Thank you very much, Robert Shields Jr. for the dollar 99. Why will the government buy assets at a deep discount? Why will? Well, they're not going to. I mean, okay. So you think about it. If you have a situation in which that people are dumping everything, what's going to happen to the asset price? All right. The price is going to fall. What's going to happen to the yields? The yields are going to rise dramatically. This is actually an opportunity for the for the Treasury to buy back their own debt at a cheaper price. All right. I mean, they're going to talk about this being a normal operation for balancing issues and whatever. I mean, they're going to come up with all kinds of excuses to 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 make it seem like this is not this is not an issue. Like this is like normal business practice. They're going to describe it as normal business practice. They're going to have people talk about it as if it's normal business practice. Like that's, that's what it's going to be like, if there's any attention brought to it at all, it is going to be like pushed away. Like it's not a big deal, nothing to look at here. But this statement alone that I keep reading about should tell you that it's much different, right? That 
it's to improve the willingness of investors and provide liquidity. I mean, think about that. This this that simple little quote right there. Improve the willingness of investors and provide liquidity. All right? That's what the that's what the whole idea of the bond buyback program is to is to improve the willingness of the investors. Just like it was for the special purpose vehicle. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys for being here so much. I'm kind of skipping through all this, so I, I appreciate all the comments and maybe the questions that were up there. But um, with 300 people and so many comments coming in, I just I have to kind of go get closer to uh, to the current conversation here. Uh, unsecured debt can be defaulted on. Pro, pros don't make it 80 years old. <laughs> Uh, answer my question. Why was the U.S. ignoring and sabotaging their poorest but giving unbelievable aid to illegal immigrants? What do you want me to answer? I don't, like, you want me to answer a question? You want me to find logic inside of the beliefs that come from government? I mean, I don't even, like, I can't like they do stuff that doesn't make sense all day long. And you want me to try and like come up with some kind of reasonable defense to that <laughs> you know, or explanation? Like, you know, like I can't. Ex that's... <laughs> all right. Uh, moving on. Uh, debts are not paid. They're discharged, but not discharged with more debt, only with final settlement money. Yeah, see, these are the type of things that All Nighter and I are going to have a conversation about because, like, a lot of times, you know, the way that we understand the system is so, like, <laughs> there, it's literally the matrix, you know, and when, like, we're going to, we're going to meet up this week in Vegas. So this weekend, and at some point we're going to find a time to do a live stream conversation talking about like, you know, like sovereignty type stuff, you know, and, uh, that'll be one of them. We'll bring that up. Uh, need more kids to put in schools to justify budgets. Yep, that sounds about right. Uneducated. Okay. Do you play the market today? Did you play the market today? No, I'm just like, literally, I'm a buy and hold kind of person because really I'm trying to build up a portfolio. I'm not a trader. I tried doing like, you know, day trading kind of stuff back in the day. And it was very difficult for me to try and make any money at it. I just found that it was like, not for me. However, I do like dollar cost averaging into stocks and I usually do it over the much longer run. Um, like not even, like, I can't even say like, you know, that I'm doing it for that much of a long run because I really haven't even been doing that long. Cryptocurrencies I've been doing for, you know, some time, but silver I've done quite a bit. But as far as like actively like trading stocks, like getting in and out of the market, I don't do that. I only go in. I only get in. Uh, um, the name is All Nighter. Hi there if you're saying hello. <laughs> All right. Um, if he answers you, his YouTube will be deleted. Works for people. They are well invested and rich. I'll bring materials for the show and tell. Hey, right on. Yeah, it'll be good. The system is not complicated. It's very simple. Actually, you know, you're right. Uh, Keanu Reeves. Uh, like <laughs> Bill and Ted. Okay. Um, so... The, the system isn't that complicated. It, it really isn't. The problem with it is, is that we have been conditioned in such a way that we don't look at it like in that fashion. Like we hear something that is very like different from anything that we have ever heard in our lives. And we think, okay, well, this must be a conspiracy. This is a nut job thing. This is not real or whatever. And I've never heard anything on the news say this, so I can't, it's not verified, right? So this ends up being for the condition that a lot of people end up growing up in. It's just that they're just literally surrounded by, I mean, it's surrounded by a belief that doesn't, that isn't right or real. Like, I mean, you know, you see it a lot in like, you see it a lot in like just relationships and the way that people treat each other and, and stuff like that. Like they just don't get like how it is that other people feel and, and know how to interact. You see like the uh, people who don't pick up on social cues and stuff like that. It's very much similar to that, right? Is that once you understand it, it just makes so much more sense. Like, you know, it's just like, 
it, you you start to look at it in a way it was just like why doesn't everybody just see it this way it's so simple right but if you don't see it that way in the beginning it's very difficult to change the way that you believe especially the older you get you know you get into 40 years old and it's just like now it's really difficult to change your beliefs because you're pretty well set on everything but you know just understanding that you know there is like if you don't have a million dollars right like i don't have a million dollars but someday i would like to have a million dollars so i figured that i wasn't like before say i don't know even 10 years ago right i wasn't very active in the idea of actually pursuing anything that was going to get me anywhere near a million dollars in fact I had spent so many years doing the exact opposite that it has taken me a while to repair the damage that I had done in order to go to the places that I needed to in order to make a million dollars, right? So if you kind of figure that thing out way early, then you don't have to stress about it when you get older because once you get older now, you got something to really worry about because you don't have too many chances, right? <laughs> you know? uh, I don't know where I got off on that. Understanding the system, that's what it was. It's not that complicated, but it is... It is in a way if you have already gotten a belief system established. Do you see consumer debt going down after this election and then subsequently, why do you have to put the election in? Why, do, why does that make a difference? I mean, it was just like all of a sudden, like we have to make it a political issue, right? At, right. I mean, immediately, can we just like, because I don't use politics to determine what I feel is going to happen within the economy. And like, I know everybody else does, but I find that to be a very inaccurate way of trying to follow the monetary policy strategies coming from the Federal Reserve because they do not care about the administration, period. Right. And I know this because I have studied many, many speeches and many documents and not one time can I find any mention of the administration. All right. Now, there is ideas of fiscal stimulus responses and stuff like that, which doesn't really necessarily target a particular administration, but just more of the government's general response that it would take. I can't find anything political about the Federal Reserve. And people tell me they're 100% political. And I'm like, where? I mean, show me. So is consumer going to go down before or after the election? Is this based on what the Federal Reserve is going to do or not? I mean, okay, let me read the rest of the question. So, and See, I just like, I mean, I just, not to be like, you know, sound irritated or something by it, but it's just like, I don't include that into my economic theories, you know. Uh, election and then subsequently prices go down and people will not be using credit cards or buy here, pay here as much. All right. Do you see consumer debt going down after the election? Prices like I, okay. Again, like, okay, I'm, I, I'm just going to exclude the whole election part of it out of it right now. I see consumer depletion taking place like crazy. Like I work a retail job, right? Now, granted, I am kind of out in the middle of nowhere. I'm not like in some major, you know, metropolitan area or something like that. I'm out in the Pacific Northwest in the corner of Oregon, right? But it does have a reflection of what takes place within the economy. Granted, I am in a small store, right? But the sales have dropped dramatically. Like the retail sales have fallen off a damn cliff. It is obvious. And now when I look at like the building part of things, because I am, you know, I work at a hardware store and we do building supplies, right? The building part of things is somewhat active, like not necessarily reflecting that of what I'm seeing going on within the retail space. So I still believe that the recessionary environment is going to be hitting very soon. Right. If there is not customers coming to my store, then I'm assuming that the town over probably doesn't have a whole lot of customers going to their store either. And if they're not going to that store and they're not going to the other ones in the county and they're not going to the ones in, you know, the other parts of the state, then they're probably not doing that across the country as well. And I'm guessing that here, when the data comes out, because, you know, I'm boots on the ground and I can't share this data with anybody except for, you know, the the sites and see, you know, the, 
what are the anecdotal evidence, right? You know, that's the only thing I can really share with you guys. But it's obvious to me, like there is a slowdown taking place in the retail space. And if that is going to happen, there is going to be less money going through the system. If there's less money going through the system, then that's going to create a liquidity issue. It's like everything lines up perfectly for this. Like I'm, I'm somewhat nervous about it. Like I literally am. I'm like, dang, man, I hope I have all my ducks in a row because this is going to be a painful experience, you know, and I don't like, you know, will the store make it through it? Like my boss is pretty savvy. He owns like pretty much everything. So it's just like, you know, the, like the chances of a bank coming in are zero because he doesn't really have anything that a bank could come take, you know, he owns it all. So that's one of the reasons why I went to work for him for, the, for that very reason. But, you know, it's just like, it, it's still the business is slowing down, right? And then that says, okay, well, if business is slowing down, that means there's less opportunity out there. If there is something that I needed to do to go find work, generally, I would probably go back to what I have done in the past, which is carpentry type of work. And if there's less of that going on, or there's more people looking for it, that's going to be a very difficult time. Those things run through my head as well, right? Because I'm a working class citizen just like everybody else, right? Even though I have a YouTube channel with 130,000 subscribers on it and I'm going to Vegas to go to a speaking engagement, I still stress about those things just like everybody else does, you know? And, you know, but I, I walk with a little bit more confidence inside of things because I study so much into this stuff. I'm not really worried about what's coming because I can kind of see it coming. Right. And so if you know the storm I mean, or if you're thinking that the storm isn't going to be that bad and you don't prepare for it, you're just like, I had to blow over. No big deal. We'll just go back to business like usual. You're probably going to end up getting hurt. Like, I think the storm can get really bad. Now, is it? I don't know. With this much talk about what it is that the, that the Fed is doing to make sure that the banks are capitalized, that the Treasury stepping up to make sure that the bonds stay liquid. With all these actions that are taking place ahead of time, I'm looking back and I'm like, man, I don't know, maybe it will be a soft landing. Who knows? You know, I mean, I know at the retail side of things right now, it doesn't feel like a soft landing. It feels very hard, but you know, but what, you know, what do I know? All these things are set up and maybe very well could create that situation, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't count on it, I guess, you know. All right. Simon, you should check out what Professor Campbell Harvey from Duke is saying about the lagging shelter rent inflation. Very good stuff. Yeah. Poor. Okay. Uh, per we'll get poorer. The rich will get richer. We will be slaves if we play against the system. Maybe. Uh, sorry, that debt preceded barter. Give us some life advice. You have a lot of whiz, whiz, wisdom, wisdom. I don't know. I mean, I. The only advice I can give is the stuff that I have recognized within myself that I know has done better for me in the things that I've done. Number one is that I gave up alcohol. Right. Giving up alcohol was probably one of the best decisions that I ever made. And here's the funny thing about giving it up is that it took forever for me to recognize that I had some benefit from that. Like literally it was years and years later that I was looking back and I'm thinking, OK, I'm glad I gave it up. Right. Because I didn't want to. I enjoyed drinking and hanging out with my buddies and down at the bar and all this other stuff. And I didn't really feel like it was hurtful to me. Like I was showing up every day. I was active. I was trying to do the things that I needed to do. And I just wanted to chill out at the end of the night with a few beers and around the campfire and not be given a hard time about that. And I never really had anybody give me a hard time about it, but it didn't make it. It, it didn't that that didn't make it right. Right. See, the problem with it is, is that everybody needs to provide some sort of value to the world. See, this is where like I found it with this channel, like being able to do this channel gives me the opportunity to provide value to the world with either the breaking down of economic theories or understandings, or even just like sharing the story with you. Right. But it gives me the opportunity to bring some sort of value to the world. And this is where most people end up failing is because they don't understand this simple concept. Right. And, and here's the problem with it is, is that most of the time, most of us, and I'm very much in this boat, is that we go to work from eight in the morning till five o'clock in the evening, and we put out a lot of value, right? 
whatever it is we're doing, our sales, our carpentry work, our, you know, whatever, our, you know, maybe you're providing a services, law enforcement, whatever it is, you're providing some sort of value, right? For these, for this certain allotted time. And it's awesome value that you are bringing to the world, right? I mean, it's just like intense. You are very passionate and, and serious about it, but now you are limited eight to five, right? So now your awesomeness, your value, the thing that you are bringing can only be done between eight o'clock and five o'clock, five days a week. This is your limit to how much value you can bring to the world is right here. And then on top of it, you're also limited to the amount that you have decided to trade that time to your boss or the entity that's gonna end up paying you. Now all your value is put into a little box and it's concealed and that's as far as it'll ever go and you don't express it any further than that. Right. And this is the major problem that most people end up facing is that if they can just break the walls of that box and get out of the idea that I do provide value with my nine to five job. And then after that, I get to sit on the couch and drink beer and watch football or play video games or go do whatever it is when that is the time that you need to really be bringing the value to the world, because that's the unlimited amount. That's the unlimited place that you could go to right you're limited at your nine to five job you can only put in so many hours you're only going to get paid so much you can only bring so much value but when you break those walls down you get out of that box and you start getting into things like your own business providing your own services providing you know youtube channel or something like you know whatever it is like for me it was this youtube channel but now i have unlimited like now i can do this constantly all the time right and if it's good value and it's worthy and I bring it to the world in a way that they are responsive to, right? Then I should be able to get the abundance just flowing back to me. I don't even have to try. And really, it, it kind of happens that way. Like, you know, it, it sometimes I look at it and it's like, well, there goes that, you know, and it's just like, so it was, it was fun while it lasted. But then I realized it was just like, dude, have you really been bringing the value? Is that the, you know, is that the attitude that you want? Because you can put the value out there, get rewarded for it believe that you are deserving of this reward, thinking that it'll last forever, and then it starts to go away. And you wonder, man, what happened? So you go back and you start providing the value again, but it doesn't come back. And you wonder, man, why isn't it coming back? Like, I mean, I did this, I got this value, I didn't like really maintain it very well, it started to go away, so I go back to try and providing the value again, but it doesn't flow back, why? It's because you have to do it. You have to provide the value. See, when I got it originally, I've been putting it out there for a while. I wasn't thinking about what a, any kind of reward. I didn't even know I would get rewarded for it. I was just doing it, right? And the rewards just came from it. Doing it and expecting a reward isn't kind of quality value, right? You do it without the idea of the reward or the reward will just show up. This is my life advice. This is how I've figured things out, you know? Anything that you ever try to pursue, most likely, it will run from you like any like if you try to pursue money it will it will be harder to find you know it's one of the reasons setting this like the whole members channel up for a dollar right it wasn't about the money i wasn't trying to chase the money i wanted to chase the idea of how it was that i could get somebody to say yes that is valuable enough that i would like to sign up for that because i know i can get something from it that is what I was looking for is the ability to do that. And I think that that's what's happening and I'm loving it. It actually motivates me. You know? All right, let's move on. Let's talk economics. Uh, so how can, how is this going to impact small owner operator manufacturers? I mean, you know, I mean, you got to think about it. It was just like, what's going to happen if people are running out of money? There's going to be less opportunity to do anything out there. Less sales, less transactions, less everything. And so I would imagine the next six months to a year, maybe even more than that, are going to be very slow. And so it's just like, how do you profit in that? You're going to have to be very creative and nimble and, you know, and look for opportunities out there. I mean, there's opportunities to make money no matter what the market is, right? So I would, like, if it was advice from me, like, if I was to try and give advice out there, which I don't really do, 
I mean, you have to learn to adapt, right? You have to learn to adapt to the conditions that are happening out there because it's not going to be the way you want it to be. It's going to be the way it is. And that's what you have to deal with. Like you could have wish and dream and want it to be whatever way you want saying, man, if I could vote for this, if I could vote for this person in, then my business would do better. If you're thinking that way, this is the problem, right? You have to be thinking, I need to operate my business in a way that is most appropriate for this particular economy. Right. Not the way it should be, not the way it could be, not the what the problem is, but the way it is and how I deal with it. Right. Because if you get angry about the like the way it is, then you're going to be angry no matter what, because there's no changing it. Right. I mean, it's just better to accept it. It's just better to accept this is the way it is. And then how do I conduct myself to, to deal with it? All right. We got 332 people watching with 158 likes. Let's get it up to 200 likes. Presidents don't solve so sovereign debt collapse. Bitcoin does. Have you read The Great Awakening? Who really owns your assets? I haven't. Um, it's hard to find safe places to invest. Diversify the investments is all I can say. Uh, love your content, man. Yeah, well, thank you so much. I'm glad you guys are here. This is like, you know, this is how we do it. This is how we break it down. And like, I know, I I know that there's some guys out there who have some excellent content, right? I mean, I've met them, right? I mean, I, I, I'm blown away by the research and their understanding and everything that they have done. And I don't try to knock any other YouTuber out there when I say that I don't follow anybody else, but it's not because I don't appreciate their work or I don't respect it or I don't think it's valid. I think everybody should be following all their work. Everybody out there. I don't care who's putting it out there, really. Right? It's just like anywhere you can get the information. For me personally, when I was building this channel, I thought to myself, man, I need to do this, make sure that I can do this on my own, that I am doing the research on my own and that I am coming up with these ideas and these theories from my own, like my own heart, you know? And I found that when I would do like research and I would listen to other people, I would start parroting what they were saying. Like I was just regurgitating a lot of what they were saying and I'm thinking, nah, that ain't gonna work, right? You gotta do this for yourself. And so that's what I've done. And like, I know it's kind of like, it's created not necessarily like a block, but I don't communicate as much as I probably should because I'm just not researching, you know, following the other content as much as I, I could be or could have been. So anyway, but that was, again, to try and build up this channel in a more authentic, you know, from the boots on the ground, from the working class position that I am in. And I think it worked, actually worked out pretty well because I have content that is very different from everybody else's. And I know it wouldn't have been that way if I had been following like, you know, a particular economist or something like that. You know, that's what's cool. It's like, I don't have any particular individual that I follow. All the information that I get is literally like doing, you know, research, you know, just like Googling whatever or reading this particular speech and following the notes from it or something. It's like, I don't even know where I get the information from. It just from everywhere. Uh, UE, I'm hooked on buying silver. Well, good for you. I mean, there's like, I think silver is probably one of the best possessions that you could ever have. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm more, I, I mean, like if I was to like, you know, look at it at a dollar, value i have far more in cryptocurrencies than i have anything else but that was more accidental right it's just like because silver doesn't move that much like the amount of money that i put into it really is still i mean actually i'm probably the amount of money i put into it is probably under what i have in silver but but with cryptocurrencies it moves so much so the time long ago when i got some cryptos and then i had a bunch given to me by I don't know if somebody anonymous, they was when I bought the house, they sent me a huge, huge chunk of Bitcoin. And I mean, it was just like, man, talk about the ability to sleep at night after that. I mean, it totally, you know, totally chilled me out. Um, but silver is by far like the best asset that you could ever possibly have. Like it is the insurance policy of all insurance policies. It's protects you against that third party claim, which is like just about unique to the, anything else out there. I mean, cryptocurrency is on a lesser extent, but still, it's just like, that's a p computer program. 
electricity, nah, no worries, right? Silver in hand, there's nothing that can beat it. There's nothing that even, or gold, you know? But, all right. Uh, don't leave that like button alone. That's right. We're up to 179 likes. We're almost there. We're almost to that 200 mark. Let's go find that super chat. All right. There it is. Oh, did we get another? Cool. Very much. Very cool. Let's see here. Thank you very much to Candy Stuffed Corpse. Did I read that right? Thank you very much for joining the channel. You're going to very much enjoy the membership. All right. Evo, thank you so much for the $20 super sticker. Thank you. Thanks for that support. All right. Let's cruise down here and see what you guys are talking about. All right. Thank you, guys. I will become a member. Thank you. All right. She comes with interesting background with the Fed. What are you guys talking about? Your approach with using primary resources is very good. Yeah, thank you. Well, it was the only thing I really had, right? I mean, like, he, here's the thing that I found is that I, I had one time really dove into some really dark stuff. Like, things that you really shouldn't, like, wrap your head around. You know, there's some, there's some really bad, like, New World Order conspiracy things out there that can really send you into some deep, dark, dank, dark, just places you don't want to be. Very depressive, right? And, uh, and I know it exists. Like, you know, once you want, like, I don't need to be convinced, right? I don't need to be convinced anymore of, of how bad it is, right? And so, like, for me, when I hear about like World Economic Forum stuff or anything that's like New World Order esque, like I just like I'm not into it, right? This is it. It's not like it's not important. All right. My issue is, what am I going to do with it? What am I going to do with that information? Like they're going to make you eat bugs. You will own nothing. Be happy, right? And I'm thinking, no, that's wrong. That's like <laughs> that's wrong. It's not, that's not my future, right? That's somebody else trying to fear me into believing that, you know, this is my future and that what I, that's what, no, I, it's not. Like, I, I don't know how else to explain it, but that might be somebody else's future because that's what they believe, but that's not what I think about and that's not what's going to happen, right? So I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about all the little details to the to the facts of how this is going to occur and my life is going to be over because of that again like i i'm not i'm not a fan right i've been down that road so many times and it doesn't lead you to anything that is going to be useful or helpful with your life right now i mean if you're like somebody who has some money like some serious money where you can actually make some noise and actually do something well maybe that's a little different right but I'm talking like, I mean, from my position, there is nothing that I can do there. The information that I get from the Federal Reserve does. Like, this does impact my life in a way that I do make decisions based on the information that I get from it, right? I'm, like, not worried about eating bugs, but I am paying attention to what it is that this monetary policy is expecting to go with the interest rates in accordance to the average inflation rate to what it is that the Federal Reserve is planning on doing going into the future, that stuff, I feel, does impact my life. And that is important. So now, something that I thought was very interesting is that all this noise with all this New World Order and all this World Economic Forum stuff and all this talk and, and stuff, which is very scary and very impactful, and yes, it's probably very truthful as well, right? Here's the thing. It's all a cover so that you don't follow the dollar. You don't follow the money. Right, because the Federal Reserve is the more important information because that's more imp impactful to your particular life. So you can actually make changes to the world by the way you spend your money, how you save your money, where you go with it and what you do with it. That is the way you truly vote, right? The actual politician over there, uh, maybe, you know, a little bit of change kind of going on. No, the way you spend your money, where you go with it, how you deal with it, that is the true vote, right? Right there. And, you know, so understanding that is, is it, to me, is more important, right? Like, you can take in all the the scary theories that is going to, you know, impact your life from a, like, you know, this New World Order kind of aspect. 
or you can follow the money and figure out what it is that you need to do for your own personal life. You know, I think about it like, you know, one neighbor, very involved, very politically minded, has all kinds of businesses and social groups and all kinds of stuff that's associated around like all this information and stuff. And on the other side, you've got the guy who grows flowers, right? So at the end of the day, is the information that impactful, right? To the guy who grows flowers? Does it change his life? Does it change anything about his life, right? Sure, it could, right? I mean, there is places in which it does, and there is economic changes that happen that may mess with his business or something of that nature, but to take on the stress and the problems and everything that's coming from the world, does it really impact you that much, right? It's important to understand what data you are taking in, right? You get so sad, so like, bombarded with information from so many directions it makes it very confusing because now you like just so much after like the question of like you know the consumer after the election it was just like why do you incorporate the election into it why don't you just exclude that out of there in fact why are you even thinking about the election is that important i mean it's important to you i understand and you can make it important by giving all these reasons to it it's not important to me all right and i study economics every single day Right. But that election has zero importance to me because I'm looking at economic theories and powers and forces that are much beyond that. Right. That are going to span administrations. And so, yes, it is impactful in a way that there's notice and noise and, and issues that come from it that may even impact your business in your life because of what happened. But on the grand scheme of things, you know, it's a much bigger economic forces that are at play. And it, and it, and it makes following this stuff a whole lot easier when you let go of like what you think is creating the economy as opposed to the natural economic forces that are occurring. Because right? then you understand like the separation between the rich and the poor. You don't blame anybody. You just know that that's a naturally occurring thing that happens with the Cantillon effect from new money coming in. Like you could sit there and theorize it all day long. But it's really just that simple. New money comes in, separation between the rich and the poor, things like houses become unaffordable for the poor in a way that is so dramatic that it seems like it's done on purpose. But it's described hundreds of years ago, right? So, you know, it's important to understand it like that. Right on, 300 people still watching with 195 likes. We are literally five likes away from hitting that 200 mark. Uh, when will the U.S. dollar be overrun as a world reserve currency is this is the real question. Yeah, TM, I agree, but I think that's, that question is so far off from any kind of real replacement at this time that I just don't even see, like, even if you were to, even if you were to say, like, it's going to be this right here. Right. And you just you just say something like the euro or, you know, BRICS nation comes up with a currency or Bitcoin or gold or something like that. No matter what is stated as a better currency or whatever does not take into considerations how it is that a currency actually becomes a world reserve currency or the reasonings behind it being a world reserve currency or just a currency in use in general. Right. And that you have to understand Gresham's law. Gresham's law is so important because there's two aspects to it. There's Gresham's law and then there's Thier's law. And these are these are complementary. They're not they're not they're not competing theories. They are very complementary. One of them says that bad money chases out good, and one of them says that good money chases out bad. But there is economic conditions in which that are taking place that have to create that would create those two different laws to be in existence. Gresham's law says that bad money will chase out good. So no matter what, as long as the dollar is in existence, that is the bad money. Okay? So long as it's in existence, it's the bad money, and it's the one that is going to chase out the good money. And that's so difficult because people want to say, no, Bitcoin good, gold good, dollar bad, dollar fiat, dollar destruction, dollar, you know, de-dollarization, de all this other stuff they want to talk about, devaluing dollar, right? So like cash is trash kind of aspect when you look at it from the gold, Bitcoin kind of position. Okay, so Gresham's Law now says we have two currencies in use, the dollar, which is still in use, and your opportunity to use gold or Bitcoin or anything you want. Now, you have them in your hands. You are 
you're the person, right? You want the stuff. You want, you know, you want my boy's tennis shoe right here, right? <clears throat> you're going to come to me and you're going to say, hey, man, what do you want? You want dollars or you want gold? Now, me personally, I want gold, right? But I'm gonna, just going to say for the sake of argument, I'll take either, right? Because you know what? I don't, you know, my boy's like, you're almost done with basketball. You don't need these shoes no more, right? So... <laughs> I'm gonna sell my I'm gonna sell my son's shoes for whatever you want to give me, right? And so now you're sitting over there on the other side, and it's like, well, this dude's willing to accept anything. Well, hell, here's the dollars, man. I'll keep him my gold. This is the decision every single person that I have ever asked said the exact same thing, right? They would keep the gold and give up the dollars, right? Even people who don't even give a care about gold would still keep the gold. Like there would be like, now nah, there's something inherently more valuable about having a piece of metal than there is about paper. Right? But if they're equally valued, you're going to give up the paper. And that's why Gresham's Law says that bad money would be the one that's in currency, would be the one in circulation. It's because everybody would hoard the good one, the, 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 the gold, the Bitcoin, whatever it is, the good currency would get hoarded away. Now, let's say, for example, the dollar does fail. Somehow, some way, all the debts collapse and all the bull things, all the all the pulling of the rug or whatever, right? It all falls, boom. Dollar becomes absolutely worthless. Thier's law kicks in. Now gold and Bitcoin are the only thing accepted because nobody will accept dollars anymore. So this is the situation. Dollars have to completely become worthless before gold or Bitcoin or any other currency, I don't care what it is, right? Becomes into existence. In order to replace the dollar, right? It has to do something and be in, it has to be do something that is in like, like a symbiotic relationship in the sense that they are the equals, right? Like you can trade this many dollars for this many, whatever, right? You know, stable coins or whatever it is. And in this fashion, people will accept it as if it's dollars. Right. And then they won't think about it being like one better than the other. They'll just think of it as it is. Right. It's just the same as dollars. People will accept it as dollars. This is where like stable coins or central bank digital currencies or something like that can come into existence to literally remove cash out of the system because those are two different types of currencies. But yet people would accept it as if it's one. I will take cash. I will take central bank digital currencies. Doesn't make any difference to me. Right. And so if they're looked at it as the same, then all of a sudden the more convenient one that is being used like dollars when it came to dollars and gold, gold got hoarded and dollars got used and dollars ended up becoming the world reserve currency. So this is like the path that it has to go down. It's not going to just be like, oh, one day, boom, we wake up and now you got Bitcoin as the world reserve currency. It won't work like that. And in fact, it would probably fail before it even gets there because the moment that an industrious nation has decided that they will accept Bitcoin over anything else, they would hoard all the Bitcoin and they would deprive the rest of the world with the ability to even buy anything from that industrious nation to begin with. So the idea of a fixed currency within the massive amounts of globalization that we have done is probably not going to work out anyway, considering that, again, that most industrious nation would be the hoarder of the currency and then be the most powerful country out there and reign its, you know, wield its power on everybody. I don't know. Like, you know, that's, that's, I just don't see it working like that. Yeah. All right. Um, Okay. Massive war in the U.S. Okay, Cantillon effect. Yeah. Let's see. There's barely any economists talking about the Cantillon effect. Yeah, I know. I know. And this is so, this is, that's what's so weird about it is like, I, I mean, like I heard about the Cantillon effect a long time ago, right? But it was literally like, I, I'm pretty sure it was at the rebel capitalist I think it was at the Rebel Capitalist Live event, the first one in Houston. And I think it was George Gammon who had brought it up. And I thought, you know, I, I, and I thought then, I thought, you know, that, that should be expanded on a little bit, right? Because it was just like, it was, it was briefly dropped. Like the new money comes into the system and it separates the rich from the poor. And like the people who, well, 
it, it wasn't explained like that. The new money comes into the system. The people who have first access to this money get to spend it at face value. By the time that money floats through the system and gets to the hands of the people at the, at the end of the line, they suffer the most as their wages haven't gone up, but all the prices have, right? So this is literally how it separates the rich from the poor is that new money coming in, people moving into luxuries and, and you know, essentially just making it more difficult on the on the lower class of people who then have to leave the area and all this there's all kinds of stuff that comes from it but that's when it was it was brought up and i thought man that should be expanded on that should be talked about right and so i i just i guess it was in my head so i just started doing that and you know it's amazing on once i really started to dive into that and it was a um, and it was it was before that that's what it was it was Somebody had emailed me the chapter on increasing and de in the increase and decrease of money to a state. They sent me that chapter and I read that chapter and that's what got me really into it, right? So it was, I guess it was those two particular events. Uh, George mentioning it at the Rebel Capitalist and then the, then the viewer who had sent me that chapter. And then of course I just got hooked on it. And I'm like, man, I love some of these economic forces that are taking place that are described hundreds of years ago and you can recognize a lot of them today. Like, I mean, just literally like read the book or read the essay and think about some of the things that are occurring. And you're like, man, these are these are forces that like some of it is like literally human instinctual behaviors. Like once you get new money, you can't help it. Like you want and you want nice stuff. Like, I mean, if you go from making thirty thousand dollars a year to one hundred and ten thousand dollars a year, tell me you're not going to go and get some nice clothes and a new car. Like, I mean, if you do that in one year, that's like, you know, that's generally what people do. But that's the dive into luxuries. Now, that's an extreme fashion of it. But as people get new money, they start moving into, you know, nicer stuff, nicer, higher end things. And as that begins to take place, that is literally what's causing the separation between the rich and the poor and the inevitable downfall of that economy. It's so, it's sad to think because people want to work hard and get nice things. That very thing, that very act, is what will inevitably cause the misery and pain it it's just but that's just the cycle of it i mean and once you understand the cycle of it it's not it's not like it's a big deal it's just like yeah that's just the way it works you know and that's one of the reasons why you have to be very active in the understanding of nations that are rising and falling like and it takes a long time but you don't want to necessarily like plant your family roots in a in a nation that's about ready to fail right you know that's not like the idea behind it of course what are you going to do about it if you have no other choice you know if you're just if that's the way you, that's where you are that's where you are but again it's just like to me taking in this information understanding those economic forces and understanding them on a level that is much bigger than say you know this particular event caused these things to happen it's just more like hey these are like economic forces that are big and you're going to find these particular events happening within this like wars and stuff you know <laughs> 281 we lost a few people that's okay we got 227 likes i'm loving that all right we guys can't be out here all day i understand we're 100 and uh, we'll see an hour and 17 minutes into this uh smoke that button like button like a cheetah like a cheetah like a cheech and chong there it is <laughs> i don't have my glasses all right well, thank you. Best channel ever. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that, Kato. Hey, Luke. Good to see you, buddy. All right. Why are food commodities near all lows while food at the store is at all-time highs? That's a great question. And now, if you think about this, again, don't, don't try and think about it from a conspiracy theory mind because it's easy to do that. Oh, the rich companies want to make it rich and this, you know, screw the poor people over. That's easy. Simple answer cut and dry right okay now we have to think like a lot of food like if you look at some foods they're not expensive like i was buying chicken and pork the other day that still seems very inexpensive to me um i was even picking up some steak some beef at some pretty good prices as well so now like those fresh meats have come down quite a bit in price right but you're finding like a lot of the other stuff is very expensive and you're going to find like packaged things are expensive, right? Anything that was in a process, like not necessarily processed foods because, you know, I mean, 
pretty much unless you're buying fresh food, it's going to be processed in some way or another. But anything that went through a process of like being made. And I know this is like, you know, kind of kind of difficult to try and say it without like, you know, just come out like, but if you're buying junk food, like junk food's going to be expensive. Anything that's packaged up and that has been made by a machine, by by something else other than just like cutting the thing up and putting it in a package and selling it to you, that processing, right? That's where the that's where the price is going into a lot of these a lot of these items. So now you got labor cost that goes into it, you got the packaging cost that goes into it, the actual processing part of it, right? That goes into it, that's just time delay and you know, trying to get the commodity itself and all the things that go into it. Right. So you have all these other added input costs that begin to go into those to those processing of those packaged items and stuff like that. So that's one of the reasons why you see it on that fashion. But you'll find like, like I said, like if you buy fresh, generally fe fresher stuff is the, the prices on them are, are much better um, than they have been in the past. Um, anyway, that's what I've found. Did I explain all that right? Because you can see the same thing happening within like, say, the lumber industry when it comes to like, why are windows still expensive? But lumber prices have come down. Like you think they would be like kind of they're both building materials. You think they would be somewhat matching. But lumber is a commodity much like the fresh meats is a commodity. The window is a manufactured item, right? So it has much more input cost going into it, which now keeps the prices elevated on that particular item when the lumber price is going down. Is that like a fair, is that like a kind of a decent comparative comparison? I think anyway. <laughs> All right, man, look at all these comments. This is awesome. Thank you very much, infamous NYC, for the $5. I bought a new car because renting was too much. It allowed me to make more money taking jobs anywhere is that driving into luxury if that earns me money. No, and see, now that's the difference within it. Like, I mean, I think, like, at that point, it would depend on the car that you were buying. Like, I'm not trying to, like, say you should or you shouldn't. Like, I'm going to own a Camaro someday. That will be a luxury item that I will get into, but I can't do it right now because I just don't see myself but driving a Camaro when there's so many other things that I need to do, right? But there, there is a time in my life that I will want to do that. Now, when I think about, like, buying a car, like, you need a car to get around, right? You need to get to work. You need to get to work safely. You need to get to farther jobs. So you need something that's going to be more reliable. It's better to have a good car to do that with. Now, do you need to drive a decent Honda or Toyota or the Mercedes-Benz or a Tesla, right? I mean, it's just like, you know, at what point, at what type of vehicle, and then what it is that you're, you know, doing with that vehicle, if you have a ton of money, like you just have an insane amount of money, then you don't really have much other choice than to get into luxuries, right? Or invest all that money into, you know, building more businesses or something like that. But generally, if you have a lot of money, you kind of want to enjoy it. I don't think there's going to be much that you can do other than just go ahead and just get into the luxuries, just knowing that that's going to be the inevitable downfall that causes like the pain and misery. But it's not it's human. It's human nature. It's like, what are you going to do about it? You know, it, it's literally, you know, <laughs> it's like saying, you know, don't have fun. Like, why, why would you do that? Like the whole point of making money is to go have fun and enjoy it and live and live a life of luxury. You know? I've seen no drop in meat. You haven't? Wow. Like, man, I loaded up on it. It was the cheapest I've seen it in a long time. Uh, will houses ever go down in our lifetime? Great job on the Fed call. Thank you very much, too. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, will houses go down in our lifetime? I don't think in any kind of meaningful way. You know, unless, I mean, unless you're talking like the great, like, collapse that might take place or something, and then it would be a meaningful way. But if you're looking for, like, another great financial crisis kind of scenario where the house prices come down in a, in a, in a dramatic, meaningful way like that, I don't see anything in the condition, like anything within the environment that would create that condition. I mean, I just don't. Um, you know, you think about it like, I mean, I, I 
couldn't even start sitting here. I would just be like pulling stats out from a long time ago. But the amount of people who like outright own their house, the amount of cash buyers that are going into the retails or into the real estate side of things, the um, the qualifications of the borrower now are so much so much higher. So like the idea of like recreating a housing market condition that was even remotely similar to that of the great financial crisis, like the conditions that created that don't really exist today. Like some people are like, oh no, they're far worse. Yeah, okay, I get that part. But it, 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 the, the far worst part is like this huge like doomsday kind of scenario that I don't think is necessarily gonna play out. Um, I could be very wrong on that, but unless we see like some massive rise of unemployment, I don't know really where it is that there's going to be a downturn in the housing market going to come from, right? Um, you know, a lot of people want to use, say, the old uh, aging population and that this like the silver tsunami of people like basically passing away, leaving their house. I don't know what the exact statistic is, but there is a lot of multi-generations living within households now. So you have like the, you know, the, the parents and you have the adult kids. And so when the parents pass away, the adult kids now live in the house. And that doesn't really bring that house up to available inventory to, to ever make it onto the market, right? Because they're just, they never, or even if they do leave, they have to find another place to live. So again, that doesn't really like, you know, bring any kind of, inventory to the market if you have just an increase in demand because this person is no longer living there, right? So again, like I don't see that bringing any kind of real meaningful like inventory to the market that would bring the house prices down. So at this point, like outside of some kind of like catastrophic event, economic event that's like beyond something that I'm like would see like a black swan event, I don't know what would do it. Like I don't know what would cause the housing prices to go down. Because the elevated of interest, the elevation of interest, the elevated interest rates didn't do it. Like a lot of like, even I was calling it out, saying this is probably going to bring the house prices down. It was one of the reasons why I was very concerned about buying my own house. Right? Was that very thing? It was one of the few things that I feel that I got incorrectly. Was the idea that the interest rates were going to cause the housing prices to come down? It didn't happen. Right? It didn't happen in a meaningful way, anyhow. And so a lot of people, times people say, just give it time, right? Okay. I can believe that, right? Give it time into the market and eventually you'll see that impact that, you know, everybody was expecting. My buddy just put his house on, uh, just half a mile from where I live, just sold his house in three days for asking price, right? And got well over half a million dollars for his house. And it's not too far off from what mine looks like. Right, so it's pretty exciting to see that taking place inside of my neighborhood. He has a lot more going on on his property, but still it took place, right? And that happened. So I think about things that I see like that. As soon as the Federal Reserve put out the narrative, it wasn't even the Fed that did it. When the corporate media put out the narrative that the Federal Reserve was going to be lowering interest rates, this dropped mortgage rates and actually sparked a bunch of people to go out there and take out a bunch of mortgages. It brought like that few weeks, you could see tested the waters on how ready people are to about to jump into this market. And if they actually had a true belief that the interest rates were going down, like the Fed did actually lower interest rates, I think they would just start flooding into the market, believing that they would be able to refinance their loans going into the future and get those lower rates. So who knows? Yeah. All right. It should be in Vanguard funds domestic. Oh, you guys are talking here. Okay. Um, we have a ton of illegals to feed now too, but diversify your investment. Do not keep all your eggs in one basket, supply and demand. All right. The more that junk food goes up, the better. Yeah. I feel the same way, Brody, you know, and just for an example of that, like we have candy bars that we sell at, you know, at the, at the store, you know, um, hardware store. So we got a little stand of candy bars there on the, at the end of the counter. And they're two and a half dollars. They're the king size ones, like the typical ones that you see. But one particular one has been changed to three dollars and ninety nine cents. And I thought for sure nobody is ever going to buy this candy bar at three dollars and ninety nine cents. It's completely like I'm having a hard time buying them at two and a half dollars. 
sure enough, we sold we sold a couple, and I thought four dollars for a candy bar. And it's like, and I think there's people that are just willing to do it. They're just like, ah, it's good. Everything's expensive. Yeah. Joe will end shrinkflation. Really? So. I don't know. I don't want to get into it. All right. Uh, sometimes I fart in my head and smell it. Mm, good times. Uh, so much. Maybe it's time to upgrade the truck when prices fall. Soiling green. <laughs> oh, you guys are all okay. I have taken countless rides from Lyft, and the drivers are doing Lyft as a second job to pay for their car. Yeah, I mean that's like that, that's a great way to do it. It's like, you know, and this is this is how you'll own nothing and be happy, or you'll have to share your items that you have purchased, right? Just like this dude is doing. You know, you think about it. Like, in order to own a car, you have to use your car to make money with it, right? So the only people who are going to own a car are the people who are using that car to provide a service for other people. Isn't that like you can't own a car for yourself. You have to own a car and then make use of that car to provide services for other people. That way the other people can own nothing and be happy because you're providing a service with what the item that you have purchased because you can't afford it any other way other than to provide a service with it. See, this is like, you know, this is why I drive old cars. I don't need a new car. I don't, I don't, I, I am happy and it's nothing like it's literally like my cars are nothing and I'm happy with that. You know? So yeah, he's right. I'll own nothing and be happy. Uh, many European migrate to here in PH. They work remote from London, then they live cheaply here in PH, then pocket the cost of living difference. Hell, yeah, I would do something like that. All right, the better the U.S. is doing economically, the more undocumented folks will want to come here. That's been the case forever. I'm I'm having a hard time understanding like why that's a problem. Like I can't think of I I mean I can understand where people will come up with a lot of reasons but you know a nation is deemed rich by the workforce that they have. Like that's literally like it just goes to show how non-productive our nation is. Like how unproductive our nation is when we have a workforce that is so prevalent that we can't use it. Like that that's that's sad. Like we should be able to like, wow, we should put that to we should make some use out of that. Right? Out of the workforce like that, but we don't. See what the United States doesn't produce anything but the but a but a consumer. That's what it does. It, the United States doesn't produce, manufacture anything but a consumer, that's what it produces, right? And so here it is, we have this, in, this incredibly awesome workforce available and they're just gonna go and manufacture stuff for themselves instead and become a manufacturer and sell it to us, right? Because we produce a consumer, we don't produce stuff. Like, you know, Mexico produces stuff and we're gonna sell it to them or we're gonna buy it from them. That's what it is, right? Instead of like taking advantage of it. I don't know. It's part of the Cantillon effect. We can't afford it anyway, so... Like, I don't I don't find a problem with it. Like, I mean, everybody was like, this is a problem. And we'd be like, no, this is the results. This is the results. It's not a problem. It's the results, you know? And it, and it's better to understand it in that fashion. And Because what are you going to do? There's nothing you can do about it. That's what's funny about it. It's just like, what are you going to do? Nothing. Nothing can be done, you know? And it's just like nothing to fix it anyway. You know, and I'm not saying like, you know, you shouldn't at least do something about it, but like the efforts, like I, that's for somebody else to worry about. Cause like, I don't see how that's going to change, you know? All right. What factors do you think would encourage more production in a country so it can offset the consumption that it is taking place? Also, which chapters in nature of trade in general covers this? Oh, I don't, I actually, I really do need to read The Nature of Trade. I haven't actually read that one. Um, but if you read the increase and decrease of money to the state inside of the chapters of Cantillon's essay on economic theory, 
those chapters should cover it. Now, what is it going to take? Like, what factors do you think would encourage more production in a country? Is simp- is very simple, right? It's the it's the cost of production. That's that's all it really comes down to. Like, we could wish and dream and hope and pray that we could bring manufacturing back to the United States and manu- manufacture a bunch of stuff for ourselves. Here's the thing: there's no way in the world that we can do it for ourselves cheaper than somebody else can do it for us. Right? Our cost of living, our wages, our style, everything that we have going on says to says to the markets, the United States can't manufacture their own stuff because it would be too expensive. And nobody else in the world would buy it, including the United States. Right? There might be a couple of people who do, right? Some people who make the conscious effort saying, hey, I got an abundance of money and I'm totally cool with buying the most expensive thing out there because that's what the United States would produce and nobody else would buy it. Right? So... We can't. We can't produce things outside of what it is that other people can produce. So now, what is it that needs to happen in order to do that? We would have to lower our standard of living. We would have to lower our standard of living, take less wages, right, to make the input cost going into the production of whatever item it is that we want, but also make it so cheap that we wouldn't want to buy somebody else's. And the only way to do that is to manufacture it cheaper with the less standard of living within the people themselves. Nobody is going to vote for anybody to do that. That's not a campaign promise. I promise to make your life a struggle so that we can make future generations happy. Like, never in the world is a politician going to win on that. Ever. Right? But that's what's going to be needed. And since that's what's needed and never going to take place, it won't happen. Right? So it's better to not understand what it is that you need to do to fix the system. It's better to understand what it is that you need to do in order to be in a functioning position within the system itself. Because there is no fixing it. There's no fixing the problem ever. Right? <laughs> and that's like, like that's, that was one of the hardest things that I had to accept. It's one of the reasons why I gave up my politics. It was just like, oh, there's nobody I can vote for. There's no plan that could, of action that could ever possibly take place. There is nothing that can be done to fix this. But yet there's politicians out there who say that they can, and that person over there is the reason why it isn't, right? And that's how politics work. And they're, and they're and it's a delusional thinking. It can't happen, right? So, I mean, it can, but they're not, but we're not gonna vote for the person who can do that. We're not gonna vote for a person who says, sorry, you're gonna get a wage cut, you're gonna lower your standard of living, and this is the way it's gonna be, right? You're gonna earn a lot of money and eat porridge, which a couple of us will do. But the rest of us, right, the rest of the people are gonna to wanna to drive Camaros and eat two ribeyes. And that's what, that's the, the way it's going to be. Like, you can't change that part, right? You know, you can forcefully tell people they're going to work harder and eat porridge, right? Which doesn't work out too well. You know, you end up with a depressive state. Nobody's volunteering to do that. And we're not going to vote for somebody who's going to force it upon us. So, all right. Hey, the last shirt we ever will wear has no pocket. (laughs) All right. I buy my meat on bulk, but I noticed that it is it has gotten cheaper. Meat ground beef has been the same for me. It was expensive kind before 21, but the prices haven't changed much. Atep bullwhip. All right, just glad I don't live in a city because that's where things will are and are going down fast, yeah. It's not in the essay. Um, That's why I ignore the truck part. Maybe migrant to developing countries when you, money will make you more happy. Average of three children to parents. The bullwhip effect is a separate theory, but UE has a lot of content published about it. Yeah, like the bullwhip effect was really, I mean, I think it was so, like probably typically the bullwhip effect would only be like really of any kind of importance 
if it was in a particular industry in which you, that you noticed it. On a grand macroeconomic scale, the bullwhip effect really is more prevalent because of the lockdowns, right? Because that caused that bullwhip effect to begin to take place within so many things out there. And because of the bullwhip effect not being like on time with everything, like, you know, lumber, chicken, eggs, all these other things are all going to get hit by the, the different fluctuations between the rise and fall between like, you know, oversupply, undersupply. These things hit at such different times within the economy. It makes it very difficult to understand that that's what is happening is the bull up effect because people want to say like, well, when does it hit or when does? And it's just like, well, are you, what are you talking about? Like, are you talking about like a particular item? Or are you talking like, you know, what is it like maybe in a general idea, like, you know, the bulk of items, like how does that what look like? Is that like an actual date or is it more like, you know, a, a timing, you know, like this time of year, you know, like during whatever the course of like, you know, the eight months or something, it's very difficult to like say it's a broad thing, like the bullwhip effect. It's very easy to pinpoint it onto a particular item. Right? And, um, you know, so those, I mean, this, of the four economic theories, you know, the five economic theories, really the four, Gresham's Law, Triffin's Dilemma, um, oh, Cantillon's Effect, right? Cantillon's Essay, and then uh, the Bullwhip Effect, and then followed by the, by the Credible Threat Theory. You really take those things in, like you study them, like, a lot, and really, like, internalize them not just like one day read about it you know and try and like maybe l learn about it over the weekend or something like that but to take it in like on a regular basis like to really try to understand this and how it's impacting the economy and find examples of it and you know it's funny because once you do people will then like a, like you'll find a, a an ex in a perfect example of it and then people will tell you you're wrong and it's just like jesus like you can't even like I can't even explain it any more clear than this event right here. And then people will like dismiss it. Right. Like I did it with the damn farmers the other day with uh, the, what was it over in uh, France? And I was describing it as a bullwhip effect and Cantillon effect. And people were like, man, talk about walking around with a hammer, looking for a nail. This is totally a political event. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, Inside the article I was reading, like I didn't even take really any of the information. I literally was like focused in on one quote that came from one lady talking about a purchase that she had made saying that she was buying the more expensive item because she wanted to support the domestic manufacturers as opposed to buying the cheaper foreign import. That right there was the epitome of the Cantillon effect. I mean, straight up, she said it, and it was couldn't have been any clearer in how she was like calling it. And yet, everybody was just like, "Dude, this is a political event. What are you talking about?" And I'm like, "My God, I mean, it was like stated so clearly right there, and and people just want to dismiss it and say, nah, dude, you're walking around with a hammer looking for a nail.'" And I'm like, "Well, whatever, man. Believe what you want, you know." But I can I can clearly see it because I know that lady's decision was something that was taking place within a lot of people out there because they see what's going on out there, knowing that those foreign imports are going to drive the domestic manufacturers out, and there's really nothing that can be done about it because the politicians of it are literally reacting to that condition they wouldn't have been able to react to that condition if the people the industrious if the industriousness of the people hadn't risen to the point that actually provided them with the opportunity to put those kind of kind of powers on them it's just like it's so weird to think right it's like if these farmers weren't so industrious they wouldn't have any need for any of these politicians to put any kind of regulations or subsidies or burdens or anything else on them they wouldn't even mattered in fact, they would be like, dude, do whatever you need to do to do your business, right? But because they have grown to such an extent, now there's these politicians out there, these people who could say, hey, man, I don't produce anything. I don't do anything, but I'm going to make issues for you, right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> All right. The bullwhip effect is a separate theory, but you, oh, we already read that. Okay. Uh, there will be markets in the country that drop like a rock. Many of these areas are getting money that is over what the area is worth. Yeah. 
Get this cruise down to the bottom here. What time is it? An hour 43. Okay, we'll give it a few more minutes here. What, how much power do I have on my phone? All right, we'll give it like another 15 minutes or so, and then I'm going to call it quits because, well, for one, my phone's going to die, and I'm not going to spend my entire day out here doing this, although I probably could. There's some other things that I should probably be a little bit more productive on now that I have some time off, like, you know, cleaning up some storm damage and stuff. All right, $1 a month is a bargain. Yeah, thank you, Brody. I appreciate that. Anyone who finds these discussions interesting should 100% do that. Yeah, and you're going to find that, like, no matter what you do, like, if you're considering joining the channel, I really, I really encourage you to join the channel, right? Generally, the live streams that we are doing, I mean, we have close to 400 people now who have become members of the channel. And when I do these live streams, generally I try to do them later on, on, you know, in the evening Pacific Coast time to try and give people the opportunity to get into these live streams or on the weekends, like, you know, like on a Saturday or Sunday. And you're going to find that as, you, especially if you're new to trying to find, you know, study economics, trying to figure out what's going on, trying to find the information that you're missing or something like that. A lot of times it's literally just having a question answered that clears up so much stuff and you could just like you're researching looking for the answer and you can't find it well you join in on that live stream a lot of times we're going to be if we haven't already discussed it or broke it down you can ask the questions of the audience or just ask it of me hey could you please explain you know this particular theory again or this particular event or why you know things are occurring in a particular fashion you know a, a I will do my best to answer it. A lot of times you will find that the viewers themselves are answering that question in a way that is even better than what I could have answered it. And so this is the type of community that is being built when you join the channel. Like we are like-minded, serious people who understand this stuff from a working class point of view. And this is the helpfulness that actually comes from it. It's a valuable thing because most of the time you're getting information from somebody who's like 30,000 feet in the air. Right. And they they don't know you, man. They don't know what it's like to have to wait three days till payday to get a gallon of milk. Like they don't they don't understand that feeling. Right. And it's a very much different to understand economics from a position that is in that kind of realm. Right. We are working class people. We know the difference between like having money and needing to earn money. Right. And there's two different mindsets that are happening here. Now, once you understand this stuff and you start to make, you know, decisions that are based on the economic theories that you have internalized, you're going to start realizing that it's a lot easier to start moving through this world. You're going through with confidence. You're thinking of business ideas, business deals, places to put your money towards. Your savings starts to grow. You just find generally you're doing better, right? And you look back and you're like, man, I don't even realize when that happened. Right? It's because you have internalized this information and you're doing better for yourself and you don't even realize that you're doing it. That's what happened to me. Like, you know, I have I have people tell me sometimes it's like, you know, you have this YouTube channel and all this other stuff. How come you don't have like, you know, a, you know, showing off millions of dollars or something like that? You know, and I'm thinking to myself, if I had done that, then I wouldn't be doing this. Right? And I could have made that money. I could have done it with the sponsorships. I mean, the opportunity was there. Right? But it didn't feel right. It didn't feel right for the channel. And it didn't feel right for the information that I was giving out there. And I didn't think it was useful or helpful. Right? And so this is what I'm meant to do. And this is going to be long lasting and standing. Right? And this is what I feel is going to be important for a lot of people to, to then internalize is this information so that they can deal with it in a way that is not frustrating or flying at the realms of somebody else's opinion or something. You know, it's good stuff. All right. Uh, let's see. Thank you, Simon. I enjoyed the stream. Yeah, thank you, Brody. I really appreciate you being here. Rock and a hard place. Yep, I've learned a huge amount here. Fantastic content. Thank you, Brody. Yeah, and that's what's, you know, it's, it's you know, it's the stuff that I have learned. And what's cool about it is that I didn't learn this I mean, I learned it from listening to a lot of other economists and stuff to get the idea. But a lot of the stuff that I am, I have learned and I have internalized, I have taken as directly from like the monetary policy strategies coming from the Fed itself. Like trying to figure out what that was, 
led me because I would read these speeches and like literally it would take me like a week to get through a speech sometimes, maybe even longer, as I would just read every sentence over and over again because I didn't understand anything that was being written or being said. And I would read it over and over again and I would read all the little notes and everything and trying to, you know, if there was something said, I would go and research it till I figured out what the hell they were trying to say until eventually I could read the speech and it was just like, I just understood it. I just knew what they were talking about and I could incorporate that into other things that I was learning and it was just pretty soon, it was like, it was no big deal. It was like fairly easy, but at first it's hard, right? And you have to force yourself into it. It's very dull. It's boring. You don't know if you're heading down the right path or anything. Again, you know, following, following channels like this, this is how you do it. You know, once you learn some of this stuff and you take on these economic theories for yourself, you're going to realize that the business that you're in, the 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 environment that you're around, you know, all that other stuff, you're going to be able to start using that in a much different fashion in much in very much into your benefit, you know. Uh, welcome and thank you very much. Infamous too cool. Take care, guys. And thank you. So Simon. Yeah, well, thank you. Iron Wood. All right. Wow. All righty, guys. This was a great time. I had a really fun time talking about this one here. We uh, did some life lessons. We talked about the credible threats that are going to be coming from the buyback program that was openly admitted by, by uh, Josh For Frost, who is the Assistant Secretary of Financial Markets for the Treasury. Um, you know, again, I don't know how many people are explaining that, but we are going to, we are definitely going to hear misinformation, you know, as this, uh, as this event starts to take place, we will have already internalized it for ourselves. So we'll have our opinions on what's going on. So as those commentators are trying to throw their opinions at you, you will have already come up with yours. Um, you know, and again, like this is how we do it. We figure this stuff out ahead of time so that we're not just like, you know, flying around out there as somebody else's opinion. All right. Many thanks, UE. All right. Thank you, guys. Who is that? Para Building 2? Okay. You guys are awesome. I, I don't want to give up, but yeah, I got to go because I got a sunny day and a day off or the rest of the week off and getting prepared to go to Vegas, go hang out with uh, Mike Zuber and Lumberjack and All Nighter and all the rest of the guys down there. Okay. Uneducated economist, you guys let me know.